Good morning, everyone. So happy to see you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning on our second day of virtual programming for the Discovery Lab. Um, today, it's all about the kids. It's uh, the California Children's Booksellers Alliance Day. So it's going to be all kids all day today. Um, as you can see, we are in a real bookstore, <laughs> which is so great. Yay. Um, so if you hear the phone ringing or the UPS guy drops by, just know that it's the sound of uh, happy books going to their happy home. So don't worry about that. Um, I'm sitting here today with my great friend and former co-worker, uh, Pam Page. Uh, we are at Page's, a bookstore in Manhattan Beach, California. Uh, and we are joining you today, as I said, live from the bookstore. We're so happy to be here with this wonderful, wonderful panel. Um, anyway, she, uh, she has an all-star group today, so I'm going to hand it over to Pam and let her get started. Thank you, Kristen. An all-star group it is. I'm thrilled to be in the presence of these four wonderful women. And so let me introduce them to you. And then um, each one of them will have a chance to talk about their books. Um, first, we have Liz Huerta. And Liz is a widely admired short story writer and essayist published in um, Lightspeed, The Cut, The Portland Review, The Rumpus, Miami Rail, and more. Each of these short stories has also been set in the same world as the book that is um, that will be talked about today, The Lost Dreamer. And then we have Melissa De La Cruz. Melissa might wanna, there, there she, she is. is. <laughs> and Melissa is, um, her best-selling series includes the middle grade breakout hit Descendants, which has sold over 1.2 million copies. Never After, her book that she'll be talking about today is the perfect companion to that series. And then we have Catherine Applegate. And Catherine is the New York Times best-selling author of Wish Tree, Crenshaw, the one and only Ivan, which won the Newbery Medal and is now a major motion picture on Disney Plus and many other middle grade masterpieces. And last we have Mags DeRoma. Mags is a Los Angeles based artist with a huge career ahead of her. She is prolific, creative and offers something completely new like the book Awake that she will be talking about today. So welcome to all of you. I'm just so thrilled to um, to have been asked to moderate this panel. I'm a little starstruck, I will admit. So, <laughs> but we're gonna start with Liz. Um, so Liz Huerta, um, would you like to spend a couple, you know, two to three minutes talking about your book, The Lost Dreamer? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on this gorgeous Tuesday morning. Um, the Lost Dreamer is my debut young adult fantasy novel. And can you can everybody hear me okay? I just want to check that. Okay. It's my debut young adult fantasy novel. It's the first book in a duology, and it follows the story of two young women, India and Saya. Um, the world is a fantastical secondary world, which is based and informed by pre-European contact Mesoamerican cultures and landscapes. My elevator pitch was kind of a YA Mayan-ish Game of Thrones, but very feminist and about female, about relationships between family and um, the sacred gifts we carry within us. It's a story of these two young women India and Saya, who are both born with the same gift, the ability to dream. When they sleep at night, they enter into another dimension where they're able to receive messages from spirits to bring back for their communities. India is born into a lineage of dreamers in the sacred city of Alcanza, this beautiful pyramid city with traditions and protections and a lot of political intrigue, which is threatening the existence of the dreamers, whilst Saya is born in the wild far away and keeps her gift a secret from everybody except for her abusive mother. There's a prophecy in the land about someone called the lost dreamer. At the end of the cycle in which they're living, the lost dreamer will show up to either destroy or save their world. And I really just wanted to explore how the gifts we are born with are shaped by who we are born to in the societies that we live in. And I'm very excited about this book. I'm really excited to, um, I call it my ancestrally informed imaginings. Um, 
This book is very close to my heart, the landscape where my family's from. And I just wanted to explore this world and plant these seeds of curiosity in wonder in um, readers whose ancestral homelands are in the Americas and other readers just to show like what a wonderful world has existed and still continues to exist, but with fantasy, you know, so we can have like jaguar women and people riding on big birds. Great, thank you, Liz, for that um, introduction to your book. Um, I'm going to deviate from my order of questions that I had for you because you you talked about India and Saya, and I was so taken with them and felt that I I was in their heads when I was reading the book. How did you how did you make them so real to the reader? I mean, you know, I know that's the goal of every writer, but I did really feel like I could think like them. You know, it may sound silly. I feel like what really helped me in this book, I've just had a really long meditation practice for 20 years. And before I would write these characters, I would go into um, a meditation session wherein I would really just try to embody who they were and kind of imagine myself into their lives. And um, my mantra, my prayer, my the way I entered the story every time I wrote was, I trust the story that is choosing to emerge through me, through these characters. And so, not to say that it was channeled or anything, but I really feel that whatever was going on in my head subconsciously, as long as I kind of entered their mind frame and the, kind of embodied them in a way, it just flowed. And I, I was surprised. I was really often surprised. I'm still surprised when I go through the manuscript. I'm like, who are you? Hi, how, did, <laughs> how did that come out of me? But I think it has to do with just this, you know, before I wrote, before I write, I do a long meditation session just to kind of ground myself and trust the characters and trust the story and so far it's worked out. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with these two. I, I put them through some things. I put them through some things, but um, I really appreciate the grace and the fortitude they hold as, as they move through their worlds. Oh, that's so fascinating. The meditation that you do ahead of time. I have to imagine that that does really help the flow of your story and what comes out. So, yeah. Um, well, as taken as I was by the characters, I was very taken by the setting and felt that, you know, was, especially chapter one just drew me right in. Um, was the setting of the book developed first or did they kind of come along simultaneously? It, that, it's chicken or the egg, right? Like, you know, I think they're very interconnected that these characters are very informed by their landscape and the landscape in the world is built by the characters. Chapter one is set in the sacred city of Alcanza, which in my imagination is based on um, the Mayan city of Palenque in Chiapas. So this beautiful pyramid temple city in the jungle, but coastal. And um, I've traveled extensively through Mexico and went to art school down there. And every time I would go to these archeological sites and wonders, I would just feel overwhelmed by the power of the landscape and the majesty and think, think of all the stories that exist here that we don't know. And I would just sit on the steps of some of these temples and pyramids and just think what what possibilities, what's like, who laughed through here, who cried through here, who loved. And so I just wanted to inhabit that landscape that my ancestors inhabited and bring it to life in a way that, um, that felt very alive to me. And that, I don't know, it's just, it was, it, they're very sacred places. And I just wanted to bring them into the contemporary world and say, hey, check this out. This is our land we live on right now. Let's let's remember these stories and honor them. Well, you did a fabulous job of that <laughs> because it's very, a very, very special setting. I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times that your culture was brought into this book. Are there other elements that you'd like to share um, that you've brought in from your culture? You know, um, my father's from Mexico, my mother's from Puerto Rico, so I wanted to kind of inhabit this pan, almost a, a pan-Indigenous landscape. So 
in my imagination in the book, it's set in what would be what we call present day, you know, Mexico or Central America. Um, there is a group of people who are um, island dwellers. And in my imagination, they're kind of the fantastical version of Pacific Islanders, you know, very Samoan, um, Hawaiian, Tongan. They have that kind of landscape. There are characters, um, Akal towards the end of the book. And I imagine her being, you know, Inuk from Alaska, you know, traveling, you know, she rides this boat all the way down the coast. So I just wanted to have this Pan-American landscape because these trade routes existed. These this interconnectedness across this entire landmass did exist and influence each other. And so I just wanted to kind of bring that into focus and say like, hey, here it is, this, this Pan-American indigeneity that's just gorgeous and so full of possibility. Uh, that's, it, it is amazing the way that you are able to insert so much of your culture. And I, th I think everybody is going to love that part of the story too, so. Um, I did want to ask you a few questions about your writing, and this is your first longer length um, book. Were there, well, because I know you're a short story writer, were there challenges that you faced with writing a longer book like this? It was a really long process. Um, and at some point, you know, there were a lot, I think like any writer, there are points you don't trust yourself, there are points where you just struggle. Um, but at the end of the day, the story just wouldn't leave me alone. Um, I don't know if you know anything about my uh, my work background, but um, I worked construction for 20 years for my family business. So wow. a ton of this book was written on construction sites in my truck. I had a little notebook in my work apron and I would just listen to audiobooks all day and let my mind run and I'd climb off the ladder and run to my truck and write down scenes and things like this. So this book was written over 10 years, a lot of time on construction sites in the back of my truck, just sitting there scribbling and then coming home and transcribing. And it just would, I, I abandoned it a million times, but it, they it would just come knocking and say, hey, we're not, we're not done with you. You have to tell our story. Okay, I read a lot of bio material on you, Liz, but I never saw anything <laughs> about being on construction sites. So I love that. And, and I can see that, you know, the story was probably written over a number of years. And, and it's just, it's just beautiful. And all of the, um, the readers are just going to be just so enamored with, especially the two main characters. Thank so. you. Okay, I think we are going to um, go on to our next author, Melissa um, De La Cruz. And would you like to spend a couple of minutes talking about Never After? Sure. Um, so my series is called Never After. And um, it was kind of uh, inspired by, you know, uh, wanting to write about kids who uh, live in books, you know, who's real lives are about reading um because i was that kid uh i think that uh you know for until probably i was 18 i spent most of my time reading and i would be the kid you know in the corner of the party reading i hated going outside i hated socializing i mean all these things were just way too scary to do um and you know i spent every lunch hour in the library um, I read, you know, dozens and dozens of books, um, and that was kind of my life. And, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, we're kind of seen as these very, you know, strange people. Like, why don't you want to make friends? Why don't you want to go and talk to people? Why don't you know? And, uh, and I just love books. And, and that was how I wasn't lonely, you know, because my friends were in books. And, you know, I remember uh, just feeling that that you know, part of my life was so real, you know, my memories of childhood are memories of reading. Um, so I kind of wanted to, you know, write a book for those kids. Uh, and of course, you know, the biggest wish fulfillment is, you know, when the characters in the books, you know, uh, are actually real. So she, uh, Philomena's 12 year old girl, who's a little bit bullied, she's a little bit of an introvert, she doesn't quite fit in. Um, she knows she's adopted. Uh, it's a mixed race, uh, multicultural family. Uh, her dad is Korean, her mom is British, and she herself, she doesn't really know what her background is. Um, 
which makes her a little lonely. And then one day she's going to go to the bookstore to get the last and final book and her favorite series, Never After. And when she gets to the bookstore, the uh, really nice bookseller tells her that there's actually no book. Um, the author has disappeared and there's never going to be an ending to the series. So she's crushed. And, you know, what, you know, how sad, you know, the worst thing, you don't even know how the story ends. And as she walks out of the store, she bumps into um, the characters from the book that she thinks are just fans, you know, playing cosplay. But then they're attacked by ogres and they run and they um, fall into a portal and she discovers, you know, that Never After is real and that she herself has a part to play in the final story. So it's a it's a really fun adventure and it's a twist on fairy tales. Uh, it turns out all the fairy tales that we know as we know it are, are wrong, you know, so, and it was also inspired by the original story of Sleeping Beauty, which apparently does not end with Sleeping Beauty waking up from True Love's Kiss. There's actually a part two <laughs> to Sleeping Beauty where, uh, you know, she marries the prince, the prince's uh, mom is an ogre and Prince uh, Sleeping Beauty's children are killed and, you know, and she's killed and the prince is uh, uh, blackmailed for her murder. So it's this really gory and terrible story. And I thought, well, what if that story happened um, where the fairy was putting her to sleep in order to not have this terrible fate happen. So I kind of twisted it like that. So the evil fairy um, perhaps maybe is not so evil after all. Um, so it's a really fun adventure. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, readers who know uh, fairy tales really well, will see a lot of fun Easter eggs uh, in the characters and in the stories. And it's a little bit like, uh, you know, my elevator pitch was uh, fairy tales meets Lord of the Rings. So there's like a lot of classic fantasy genre kind of baked into it as well. And there's this great, this great cover, which is spectacular. And this is the first in a new series, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep, and yeah. Stolen Slippers is coming out uh, next year. And it is a twist on Cinderella. And, uh, and it's really funny. It always makes me laugh when I say what this boy, I won't say it. <laughs> Cinderella's an <laughs> ogre, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. now I have to tell you, Melissa, um, I, I am a big middle grade person and I work with middle graders um, in a book club here. And uh, when I read the opening of the book and this, this young girl goes to the bookstore to get the next in the series, that's a scenario that happens on a daily basis. You know, they come in, they need that next book now, like not yesterday, not later today, they need it right now. And so when I'm reading that the book doesn't exist, I can just imagine the whole scenario. Where in the world did you come up with that idea? <laughs> I mean, I think as a reader, that would be the worst thing, you know, that would happen is not knowing how the story ends or, you know, and I have read series where, you know, the author wasn't able to finish it or the publisher dropped the series or you know, and it's always so sad, you know, when you don't know uh, the ending of a story. And I just thought, you know, I really like that whole midnight party. And, you know, I feel like the last 10 years, there's just been a lot more of book culture and mainstream culture. And I just thought, well, what if, you know, there was this big midnight party, but then there was no book, <laughs> you know, how terrible that would be. So yeah, I was definitely inspired by, by all that, you know, kind of like that, be, you know, where suddenly, you know, talking about wizards and fantasy wasn't just a niche um, thing that, you know, uh, just a few readers knew about it, you know, it was something that everybody was talking about and conversant with. So, so I thought that would be fun to play with. Definitely, I think, yeah, as a bookseller, I was a little devastated, though. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> what do you mean there's no book? No final book? What? <laughs> okay, Philomena was so cute. I, I loved her character. And, you know, she's this girl from LA. Her parents are these obsessive writers. And then it goes into the fairy tale portion. Uh, did you, are there any of your own family in this story? <laughs> um, Philomena is not my child. Uh, my child is, uh, you know, maybe she would tell me anecdotes about her life in sixth grade, but, you know, I definitely try not to write about um, at least my child, my, my child, my daughter. But yeah, I think the writer parents are 
a little bit based on me and my husband, you know, kind of that distractedness. And I think mom, the mom never cooks. So it's always, they always order out, you know, and yeah, guilty as charged. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just curious. <laughs> I just thought it, she was a fun character. Um, you know, you've been mainly a, a YA writer. And so what led you to middle grade? Um, yeah, I've been writing. I had written some middle grade uh, kind of earlier. I'd written a book series called The Ashleys. And then Descendants was a middle grade uh, series as well. So, uh, you know, I kind of like writing middle grade. It, you know, I like writing about friendship. And, you know, I so remember being 12 and being 11 and, you know, what the concerns were at that age. So, you know, it's not so much, you know, in YA, it is really, you know, kind of like growing into, you know, your identity and discovering who you are. And I think in middle grade, it really is about kind of discovering what a, what a friend is and how to be a friend and um, what is a good friend, you know, because that's what they're going through with sixth grade with the cliques and, you know, with friends from kindergarten, suddenly not friends anymore, you know, and I just saw it in, in, um, in my kids experience and, you know, and then remembering what happened to me, you know, in sixth grade. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really important to find, you know, kind of your group of friends. So I, I enjoy writing about that. Well, the middle graders are going to be thrilled to have a new series too. They're always, always looking for those new series. Um, just one other question I wanted to ask you is, you know, this book I, I felt was a little different in the way the fantasy was done. And you sometimes have real world only chapters and then fantasy. Was that hard to separate them that way? Not particularly. Um, I think with Blue Bloods, my vampire series, which was a kind of hidden world uh, series where uh, it was set in the contemporary world, but then there was all these secrets, you know, a secret society of vampires that was in our world. Um, you know, whereas this is a portal fantasy where half of it is set, you know, in Los Angeles and half of it is in Never After. So, you know, I had to think about what, you know, what that looked like. And, you know, the editors, whenever you write a fantasy, editors are always like, well, where, where's the map, you know? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, it's kind of a flat land. <laughs> You know, it's very medieval, you know, the earth is not round <laughs> in medieval fantasies. So yeah, a little bit, you know, it, it's a little bit harder. I, I find like completely reimagining worlds as in like Queen's Assassin, that book of mine, that was really, really hard. And whenever I, I write, you know, a full uh, fantasy world like that, I always tell my family, remind me that it's really hard and I don't want to do it again. <laughs> 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 Well, you do it awfully well. So <laughs> thank you so much, Melissa. All right, Catherine, are you ready to share with us? Um, Willa Dean, Kristen, you have oh, to hold up this I cover. Do. I have another great cover. Here we go. There it is. This oh. is really draws oh. you in. I love, it. I love, I love that cover. I, you know, that was um, Charles Santoso who did... Um, Wish Tree as well, and he's doing my next book. I just love his, he does animals so well. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you share with us a little bit about Willow Dean? You know, um, it kind of started in my, my backyard. Um, I live in LA, like a lot of us, I guess. Um, and we had a den of coyotes in the empty lot next to us. And I have very small, appetizer sized pets. And when we moved here, uh, a particularly burly coyote kept showing up in the back and um, peeing on our back door. So clearly this was his territory. And I, I was thinking about that very uneasy relationship we have in urban environments with um, other creatures. I happen to think coyotes are great, but I am, I, there are, as I'm sure you know, not, uh, there are some people who are not fans. So in our case, we created a, um, a catio, which, you know, the, an enclosure where the pets could go and the coyotes could not. My husband calls it a catopia because it's, it's quite <laughs> nicely decked out. But, um, but it started me thinking about that, that kind of uneasy balance. And I wanted to write about climate change because when I do school visits, it is, 
it's so on the minds of kids. And certainly here in California, you can't look out the window without, you know, being concerned about it. And uh, I wanted to do it in an accessible way that would work with even the younger end of middle grade. I think sometimes those kids are a little ignored um, in terms of content just because they're they're starting reading and but they're very very ready for topics that are a little deeper so um i decided to create my own species and i god knows i had plenty of eco crises i could have chosen from but um i decided it would be more fun just to start from scratch i had done that with a trilogy i wrote called endling and it was so much fun so I took, a, you know, a little bits and pieces of various animals and created these guys that the big, the big purple guy there is a screecher. They are reviled across the board. They scream at night for reasons no one can fathom. They uh, slap their tails when they're afraid and create a, just a horrific scent. So they're kind of, you know, skunk meets uh, warthog and uh, there's a bounty on them. They're, they're just, everyone hates them because they're really not good for tourism. And there is tourism in this imaginary town called Perchance that I've created because of these guys. These are uh, called humming bears and they are, and I so wish they existed. They are sort of tiny polar bear meets hummingbird. And they come to this area, they migrate. I had in mind, I had just been to Pacific Grove to see the monarchs there. And I had in mind that kind of annual migration and the ecotourism that comes as a result. And so these guys show up, they land on a particular kind of tree called a blue willow and they blow nests out of, they chew leaves and create bubble nests. And the nests are clear bubbles, but they absorb sunlight. So they glow all night. So it's a spectacular scene and really lovely. And everybody adores them. It's, um, naturalists call it the Bambi effect. You know, these are the cute guys. And uh, so they are both, both species are starting to attrit and nobody's quite sure why, but it's clearly gonna, gonna hurt this little town if somebody doesn't find the answer. And that turns out to be my hero, Willadine. You're gonna stop there. <laughs> 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 well, 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 I love Willow Dean. She is, um, she's really cool. Well, she's, I was ask yeah, about Willow yeah, oh, she's, yeah. She's my, uh, she's one of my favorite characters. I think, um, well, we probably all, all have a lot of her in us. I like to think she's a, you know, a, a, a touch of Jane Goodall and um, a bit of uh, Greta Thunberg, the Swedish climate activist. She's very different. I and mean, a lot of readers have, have, um, said she reads on the on the spectrum and that was intentional she's she looks at the world very differently her family was killed in a tragic fire and she lives with two older women who have taken her in and really does not go to school much she spends most of her days in the woods and she is in essence a budding scientist and doesn't realize it. i think there are a lot of kids at this age young readers who are just starting down that path and maybe don't realize it. So in, in Willadine's case, she carries a journal and she counts creatures um, about whom she's developed a, a real fondness. She's probably the only person in the entire area who has a fondness for these guys. Um, and she's noticed how their, their numbers are dwindling. And she counts leaves and she counts mushrooms and she draws you know, illustrations and she's just, she's observing all the time and she doesn't really know why it just feels like the right thing to do. And because of this, she's the one person who really starts to put the pieces together. It's sort of an eco puzzle. Uh, fortunately, uh, she's never really had friends, but she ends up befriending a young boy uh, named Connor, who happens to be an artist of sorts. He makes um, creatures out of things like uh, twigs and branches and uh, you know pine cones. He's a, he's a sort of primitive artist and among other things he makes humming bears and sells them at the, the local fair every year. 
and he and Willa Dean find this this strange but and unique bond um, in their search for answers about the creatures. So it's also a friendship story. It's about being different and accepting your differences. She's she's you know clearly an outsider in this little town, but by the end of the story, she's she's found that unique place for herself. I love that about this book because, you know, kids need to read and and kids do read about characters that are different, that aren't, you know, always accepted. And yet Willa Dean was just such a clever, smart, intuitive girl. And I just love that you presented a character to middle graders like that because I know they're going to really connect with her. Um, and that was kind of a, a question that I had uh, about Willow Dean. Well, kind of, kind of went with the whole book. I, I loved the animal characters. I loved Willow Dean. I loved the setting, this town. Um, you know, you kind of get frustrated with the towns, keep the town people. <laughs> but did it all come to? Did you have the characters first, or did you have the environmental theme first, or did it all just kind of come together? Oh, no, I had the screechers first because <laughs> I, I love animals and it was just so much fun. And piecing together, I thought this would be so easy. It'd be so much easier than, you know, having to, to be precisely accurate about a real, um, you know, biodiversity, t taking a little ecosystem and trying to dismantle it. And it was hard because um, it's 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 so revealing when you you start taking apart the you know the Jenga and and things fall apart. I had to figure out how these two very very different species had a connection and how there might be a way to uh, to repair the damage that was largely caused by humans. And I wanted to to end on a note of hope that wasn't uh, false hope, but to remind kids that at the end of the day, they are the ones, you know, like they need to be reminded, um, who, are, who are going to be uh, hopefully the ones solving this problem. We created a, a really cool resource guide for teachers and librarians and parents uh, called Go Green with Willa Dean. And um, you can find it, I think, at readwillardine.com, I believe. And it's, it's got all kinds of great resources for the after, you know, because you read a book and you think, I want to do something. I, I, I feel the, a connection here. And sometimes it's, it's so overwhelming, especially when we're talking about climate change. So it's a great place to start. And I think there's such, um, such hope when you connect with others. It's one of the wonderful things when you go to schools now. I, most of them have some kind of ecology or a climate change group or advocacy group. And if they don't, they're starting to. And I think that's really, really helpful because kids want to do something. Definitely. And I know yeah. they're going to definitely be so interested. The guide is a, a great suggestion. So thank you for sharing that. I did want to share before we um, move on, I just wanted to share, I was reading reviews of Willow Dean after I read it. And um, one of the reviews was just exactly how I felt. And my kids book group felt the same way. We wish, we wish the humming bears were real. And, I, <laughs> I'm not, and somebody wrote that in a review, you know, I wish I could have a humming bear. And the kids, the minute I showed them the cover of the book, that was their, they were like, what is that? What kind of a creature? And so <laughs> we're just enamored with it. Just like, you know, you create such interesting characters, Catherine, like when I, you mentioned the Endling series and I um, remember reading about Jairns and being so fascinated. So that's one of your very many talents is to create these very real animal characters. It's fun. I um, an exercise I do when I go to schools is uh, ask kids to create their own species, and invariably that's the point in the lecture where I completely lose control of the audience because they all want to share these great ideas. You know, a cheetah with wings. You know, and um, and it's 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 a wonderful way for you to realize 
things you appreciate about species, especially endangered species. And it's not always the things, you know, the, the go-tos, you know, the, the fact that you could fly. Uh, sometimes you start thinking about keystone species and about the way, um, you know, beavers do a whole lot of good for us that we're not aware of. There are all kinds of things to be learned and um, playing with that idea. Also because you can draw them, because you can start imagining um, their environment. Who are their predators? What do they eat? You know, what's their uh, long-term prognosis? And that that's really a, a fun way to get kids engaged, I think. All great ideas for teachers in using this book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, and we are, um, we've run the gamut. We've had YA, we've had middle grade, and now we're going to move on to Mags de Roma, who um, just published a picture book, Awake. And we're so excited about this. And the cover is gorgeous. Oh, the colors, so I think I, I'm just so drawn to. So Mags, why don't you share a little bit about this book with us? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. And um, it's been so fun to hear about everyone else's books. I feel uh, a little bit of a pinch me moment happening um, in this group because this is my first book. So um, anyway, really excited to be here. Um, so Awake is a story about a little girl who lives at the top of a building in a big city and she's getting sleepy, getting ready for bed with her dog and is just reaching for that light to turn it out when she spots a spider in her room. And as everybody knows, you cannot go to bed with a spider in your room, just not happening. <laughs> so she goes through kind of this story arc of trying to figure out what to do to get the spider out of her room. So there's nothing to smash it with. Um, there's, you know, some little tools around. And so she has to put on her thinking cap and she gets into a big sort of rolling brainstorm um, that <laughs> kind of crescendos with a um, the building of a rocket ship and blasting the spider off to the moon. Um, and uh, and then, do you, should, do you want me to, I don't know if I should like blow the, the whole end of the story, um, but basically the spider <laughs> thing, and she to, yeah, she has to go and, uh, and do something about it in the immediate. So she traps it underneath a glass. And when she does that, she kind of sees the whole, this teeny, teeny, tiny little creature who's been growing and growing and growing and growing in her imagination. Uh, and it's just this little, little guy just being a spider and that he's just doing his spidery things. And so she has a moment of empathy and, and names him and sends him home into his little web and is able to go to sleep. So she makes a friend in the whole, uh, the whole journey of it. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's a, it's everything in, in this book is kind of, there's, there's lots of layers and um, in both the art and in, in the little bits and pieces that I baked into the story, even though it's a pretty simple story. Was the um, Itsy Bitsy Spider the inspiration behind this or? <laughs> there were lots of points of inspiration, actually. I feel like it's one of those things where I have just collected experience over life and a lot of it ended up in here. Um, <laughs> There's, um, she lives in, a part, in an apartment because I always loved the line in Corduroy where the girl um, climbs five, five uh, flights upstairs to her very own bedroom. Um, so, you know, I had, we had spiders as a kid and my dad would like put a glass over them and take them out with a little cardboard. Um, there's a Nikki Giovanni poem called The Allowables that was really what prompted the idea um, it's a beautiful, like heartbreaking poem um, about how she kills a spider and should she, should she kill something just because she's afraid of it. So, and yeah, there's a lot, lot, a lot baked into it, but the itsy bitsy spider for sure made an appearance. <laughs> <laughs> well, the art, we have to talk about the art because it is so unusual, so fascinating, so beautiful. Uh, so perfect for younger children. So tell us a little bit about the art and how you created it. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, um, it was um, a labor of love. It's all, it's, uh, I think I, I have this in there. It's a gazillion little pieces of paper 
just layered. And what I do is I paint newsprint or I paint, um, I love old things. So I'll go to a flea market and find, you know, old paper with writing on it or whatever, little old envelopes and aged things. And I, I just love that sort of baked in history. Um, and, and I paint it and cut it out. And I, um, I have done a lot of, uh, graphic design and branding in my, in my days. And so the cut paper kind of allows me to like be a little, <laughs> a little more graphic designy neurotic about like where everything lands. Um, so yeah, I have, um, I actually have a piece right here. I'm going to show you um, just so you can see the scale of it. This is the city spread. Oh, wow. So like you can see like teeny, teeny, tiny little things. Yeah. I mean, everything is small. And like all of those, they're like little references to my family and, um, you know, things going on. Like there's actually a mailbox in there because there, we were talking about the post office at the time that I was making this piece of art. And so, yeah, everything is just kind of like experience sort of filters into it all. <laughs> I'm going to have to look at that, open that spread a oh, little more beautiful. closely now after it's what you just showed beautiful. us. So spectacular. Oh, there we go. I, I see a screen share of that. Yes, it is. It's just beautiful. Well, Mags, I know you've been an artist. Um, what led you to a picture book world, to the illustrating and um, writing of a picture book? Um, so, I, I mean, I do a lot of different things and I, I, I mean, just I, I need to make things. It's just like my, I need to breathe probably, but I need to make things. And so um, I'm always, you know, dabbling in different, different things. And um, a couple of years ago, I started um, a company with my sister-in-law called Silly Street and we made a board game and it's all these little characters. It's for preschoolers and it helps kids build character or like social emotional skills. And so when we did that, we were kind of like entrepreneurial always like coming up with ideas and stuff. And so we started that company and that like naturally had me illustrating a million little animals to put on this like really intricate illustrated game board. And so, and it just kind of rolled in and I had kids at the time. And so they like, it just everything. I think when you, I don't know, for me, uh, I have noticed this about a couple of friends who like, as they have babies, they're like, I think I'm going to write a picture book, or I think I'm going to start illustrating. Um, I have, yeah, a lot of friends who are in, you know, kind of the branding world and who have those like either writer or art, you know, art skills. Um, and it's sort of like a natural thing that happens to you <laughs> when you become a parent. So um, yeah, that sort of just like all coalesced and um, I started playing around with like tactile things because Silly Street is all done on the computer. And I just, I love everything I do for, um, I did for Awake and for some upcoming books is all tactile. Like there's no Photoshop in there. I mean, just like color adjustments maybe, but yeah, I like to make things in reality. <laughs> You're so creative and your, your hands are involved in so many different projects. I love, I love hearing that. So I think, I know we're going to be seeing more picture books from you. I hope so. I know. <laughs> I, um, I wonder, is there um, inspiration from somewhere that your illustrations take shape? Were you influenced by anyone, um, anyone oh. else's artwork? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I love, uh, Gyo Fujikawa is, uh, is a huge inspiration to me. I love her work. I have a, an extremely tattered version of her Come Follow Me um, that just sits on my shelf uh, always. Um, and she is something about her work that I think comes into play in my work in a different way, but um, it's just all the little pieces. Like she put all these teeny, 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 tiny little details that come in and like sort of form a symphony of you know, of this visual expression, which I just, I think it's so stunning. And so like, it just draws you in and you just search around for all the little perfect things that equal this greater whole. Um, and then I love um, M. Sesic. I, I'm not sure if I say his name right, but he did all of the, um, you know, the London, the Paris, the New York, um, this is New York, all of those books. Um, I just, I love that vintage uh, sort of you know, the vintage shape making, I think is really cool. And the, the textures that are in those books have always fascinated me. And I, I think part of like getting to this book was trying to achieve, um, 
she achieve a piece of art that has the level of like where I can kind of compare what I've done to my admiration for what he did, <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. No, I just, no. I, I love it. I think his, like the details and the textures and, and the simplicity of the shapes, but like equaling some, uh, you know, like a, a very familiar feeling is a, is sort of like what I strive for in, in illustration. Great. Well, they're, they're certainly just stunning. So Thank we've you. really enjoyed looking at that. And I know I can't wait for the kids to start seeing it too. So Thank you. Well, you guys, I can't thank you enough uh, for joining us today. Uh, we're going to have to wrap it up because the store is about to open and, and Pam is going to start selling your books. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll start to, to close up, but I wanted to um, give a shout out to our friends at Macmillan for sharing all of these amazing authors with us. Uh, we enjoyed meeting you or re-meeting you and we admire your work so much and we appreciate your time today. Um, just a little rundown of the virtual schedule we have planned for anyone else who'd like to join us this afternoon at 12 we have another author speed dating event uh, this time it's all kids authors um, and then at 2 p.m we have an amazing editor uh, buzz panel with children's uh, editors from penguin random house that's at two and finally tonight at six o'clock we have a really uh, fascinating discussion planned with uh, brendan kiley the author of the other talk uh, you do not want to miss it. It's going to be great. Um, you can sign up for all of these um, on our website, KalibaAlliance.org. And if you want to take a look at galleys or our exhibit hall, that is at Kaliba-Annex. So you can find that there as well. So anyway, thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Have a lovely day.